Good morning. All right, y'all, let's uh, stand up and let's praise our Lord.
as we baptize because we're going to cheer for Miss Evelyn in just a minute. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father God, we love you. We're here to worship you. God, we want to live a lifestyle of obedience and trust to you and worship you with every step that we take. So God, I pray that you would bring Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 back to mind this week. That even if we can't remember all the words, we will simply remember, I need to trust God. I need to trust Jesus. Completely, exclusively, Jesus, I'm trusting in you. Because God, you are the creator of the universe. God, you have breathed breath into our lungs. You've blessed us with your son, sending Jesus to live a perfect life, to die on a sinner's cross, but to raise again, to pay the penalty of our sins. And God, you have blessed us with your forgiveness. You've blessed us with your love. Our souls are sealed for the day of redemption by the name and the blood of the Lamb. It's the Holy Spirit. We're gathered in the name of God this morning, so I know that you are in our midst. We invite you here. God, I pray that your spirit would wash over us, that your truth would fill us, that we would recognize with our ears and with our hearts and with our minds just how true truth is because you're a chain breaker. We will know the truth and the truth will set us free. So God, I pray for liberation of our spirits, of our minds, of our hearts this morning. God, I pray that for your church family right here at the church at Lake Forest. And we thank you for setting someone free that we get to join in baptism this morning. So God, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, church family. That's Robbie. He's going to do the baptism. <laughs> If you don't know Robbie, Robbie is, is our, Robbie and Hannah are our kids pastors. Uh, they lead our children's ministry. And this is Miss Evelyn coming down into the pool. Hey, Miss Evelyn, are you in fourth grade? She's in fourth grade. That's what I thought. I just want to make sure. I hate to, you know, say that they're younger if they're older. Miss Evelyn is in fourth grade. And one of the things that Miss Robbie and Miss Hannah were telling me about her is that she's a little shy but she wants to be out front. Like she, she is beginning to do things and asked to do things. And I believe that God is gonna use her because God can take someone who's shy. You know, God took Moses who said, I, I, I got a stutter, I, can't, I, can't, I, don't, I don't know if I can, I don't, I don't know if I can be in front of people. God took Moses and said, I'll give you the words to say. I'll be your mouth. You just trust me and follow me. And he raised up an amazing leader. And I believe that for Miss Evelyn that even in her shyness, she will be a young leader. So that's what we're gonna pray for her this morning. Now, baptism is a picture of what Jesus has already done for us, for, for her, and what Jesus has done in her. This isn't magical water. She was saved before she set foot in that water this morning because she trusted Jesus as her savior. So Miss Evelyn, I got a quick question for you. Do you trust Jesus as your savior? Yeah, and do you commit your life to following after him? Amen. Amen. All right. Can we pray for you this morning? I don't know what happened to the baptistry, but it like almost completely drained. That's my fault, apparently. When I turned it off, apparently I turned it on to drain this morning. So he's going to take Evelyn way down in about three inches of water. All right. Man, it was warm and ready, and then I messed it all up. All right. Jesus in front of me, Satan behind me. He will do anything that he can to stop this and to stop you from trusting him. So join me as we pray for Miss Evelyn. And then when I say amen, Robbie's gonna take her under and we are gonna cheer when she comes back up, however wet she may be, all right? Let me pray, dear Heavenly Father, God, again, we come into your courtrooms with praise. God, we are rejoicing this morning along with Evelyn's family. Thank you for Miss Lisa who, who has been so faithful in coming and bringing her. God, thank you for her parents. Thank you for uh, her other family members that may be here this morning. God, I just pray that you will bless her life. 
God, we are trusting you that she is going to grow into a beautiful young woman on the inside and the outside, that she will be strong in her faith. And God, we know that you were gonna use her someday because you have called her by name. She is yours and you are her God. So God, this morning, it's our privilege to baptize her. It's our privilege to stand with her as her church family. But God, we pray that you will lift her up. We pray for her family around her. Help us as her church to hold her accountable, to challenge her, to move her forward. But God, you do the changing. You do the saving. So we give all the glory and the honor to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, church, get ready. Miss Evelyn, it's our privilege to baptize you as our sister in Christ, buried with Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and raised with Christ to walk a new life with Him. God some more this morning.
for this time that we get to gather here at your house, God. We know there's no one like you, so we wanna praise you and worship you this morning. You speak and waters crash upon the sand. The oceans push and pull at your command. You hold the moon and stars within your hands. And all with just a breath, the world began. Yeah. 
Father, we want to hang on every word that you give us. God, we just, we want that to be our prayer, that your spirit would fill this place. You would fill our homes. Fill our hearts, Jesus. Would you fill this church with people who are seeking after you? People who are far from you that come to know who you are. Fill this place, Jesus, with people who love you. People who want to give you everything. Good morning, church. I'm glad that you are all here this morning. Hope that you're ready to, to dig into God's word a little bit. We're going to be in Nehemiah chapter two in just a moment. This is week two of a series that we've called More uh, because we believe that God has more for our church. And we also believe that there's more that we can do for our community as we are for our neighbors and for the next generation. And so what I've asked you guys to do, and so many of you have done it week in and week out, I asked you, you know, in the last series, Pray Like Jesus, that you would be with us for all four weeks of that series because we wanted to, to be praying together. The goal of that series was to prepare your hearts for this series so that as we started our 21 days of prayer last week, we'll continue to pray together. Um, also, I left it, did I leave it at home? I took a picture of it, it's out there, yes. Uh, <laughs> the 24 hours of prayer. In case you missed last week, we're going to have 24 hours of prayer here at the church on uh, Friday, October, th uh, I'm sorry, Friday, September 30th until Saturday, October the 1st. We're going to go from noon until noon. So what I've asked everybody to do is fill up all, like I've got two columns on that sign-up sheet. It's out at the cafe. I think all but two were filled up the last time I looked at it. Um, so in the first column, like put your name or put your family's name if you've got a family that you'd bring with you and pick an hour to come and to pray for an hour. Now, if the first column gets filled up with all the hours, then go to the second column because I want as many people to come and pray as possible, but I also want to make sure that all 24 hours are covered. I'll be here for 24 hours praying along with you. If you want to invite your friends or your family to come that don't normally come to this church to come pray, or if you know somebody who needs prayer, maybe, they, maybe they're, they're looking for an answer in their life or they're looking for healing in an area of their life, bring them and we'll pray for them. But come and be a part of that 24 hours of prayer in just a couple of weeks. Now, um, last week in Nehemiah chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, we took a look at this idea of praying more. Because if you go back and you read it, I'm not going to re-preach the whole sermon, you can watch it online. But if you go back and read the very beginning of Nehemiah 1 and then the very beginning of Nehemiah 2 and you do a little historical study, you realize that from the beginning of chapter 1 to the beginning of chapter 2, about four months has passed. It's gone from kind of the Thanksgiving Christmas season to around the Easter season. And for four months, Nehemiah has been praying. The reason that he's been praying is because he's, he, he, uh, he's in captivity. 
Babylon has years before has um, destroyed the, the, the nation of Israel, of Judah, taken them into captivity, uh, torn down the, the, uh, the walls around the city of Jerusalem. So, um, but a remnant has gone back. They've been allowed to go back to begin rebuilding. And so a few of those people, they come to Nehemiah and they're like, you know, Nehemiah asked them, hey, what's going on in my hometown? I want to hear what's, you know, how's it going? It's got to be doing good. Y'all have been back there for a while now. And he finds out that the walls are still broken down, that the city is still without protection and without gates. Not a whole lot of progress has been made in all the years that the remnant has been there. And so Nehemiah, when he hears that, he begins to pray and he prays for four months. And then he steps into the, into his job, which is to serve the king who is his captor, but he is his king. He submits himself to the authority of the king, and his job is to be the cupbearer, to, uh, to make sure that whatever the king might eat or drink, that it doesn't have poison in it. So Nehemiah's job was to put his life on the line to save a guy that he probably doesn't agree with most of the time, but that was his job. So he did his job well. I don't care what your job looks like. Even if you don't like it, God gave us work to worship him with. And so we see Nehemiah worshiping God in his work, doing his best. But after four months, one day, Nehemiah walks in and he looks sad. He's never looked sad before in the face of the king. And the king immediately recognizes it and recognizes that something may be up. You know, maybe Nehemiah's sad because there's, you know, this coup coming that's going to overthrow me or whatever. Maybe Nehemiah's trying to, to, to kill me. The, the king doesn't know. So he asks Nehemiah straightforward, I've never seen you sad. What's going on? And so Nehemiah, I want you to go back and read this for homework, the beginning of chapter two. I, think I want to say it's verse four, verse five. It says, then I prayed... And I asked the king, right? Nehemiah prayed again. He prayed a short, brief prayer in the moment, in the spirit, not out loud. He prayed the, the kind, of, kind of spontaneous prayer that a lot of us pray often, but his spontaneous short prayer was based on a lifestyle of prayer that he had been leading his whole life, and it was based on the four months that he had been praying leading up to this moment. But even in the moment, he's like, all right, God, I need you, right, in this moment. And so he tells the king what's going on. And he asked the king to let him go back home. Not only let him go, but give him letters so that he could go to the, to the leaders uh, around the nation. He would, be, he, be, he would be able to get back there safely, but that he could also go to the king's forest, cut down all the trees that he needs to, to help him rebuild, and go back home and, and spend however much time it takes to rebuild the wall. And the king answered his request. The king allowed him to go. The king wrote letters and sent with Nehemiah. And so we see Nehemiah going back. And what we learned last week was that we just need to pray more, to pray all the time, to pray without ceasing. So this week, as we get into the rest of Nehemiah chapter two, this week is about inviting more, invite more. Um, and we're gonna see Nehemiah do that. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit this morning. But if you have your copy of God's Word, I'm going to start uh, in verse 9, and I'm reading from the ESV translation this morning. Uh, if, if you want to follow along with me, it'll be up on the screen as well. It says, Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent me officers of the army and horsemen. I think this is amazing. Like the king's given him everything that he needs. He's even got an army with him. The army is at his beck and call. This king is like allowing him to go rebuild a city so that it would be a fortress against the king, possibly, but he sent his own army with him. It's amazing what God does when we pray. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite servant, heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I'm not going to go into great detail about these guys, but know this, they are dissenters, they are detractors. They are other leaders, other governmental officials and leaders of the people that have frankly been making a buck off of the, the turmoil that, that Jerusalem has been going through. And they don't want the city to be rebuilt. They don't want Nehemiah to be successful because it's probably going to be a financial hit on them. It's definitely going to be an authority, you know, power grab. At least that's the way they feel about it 
towards them. And so they oppose what Nehemiah is doing. Verse 11, so I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode, he's on a horse, or he's on a horse or donkey. Uh, I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I expected the, inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. In other words, there, this gate is so broken down, the, the, you know, the, the framework over it, that he can't even get through it. He can't get under it. That's what uh, poor repair it is, it's in. Verse 15, then I went up in the night by the valley and expect, inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Nehemiah is surveying. He's getting his plan together. He's going around town. And he's doing it at night, not because he's trying to be secretive, not because he's not going to tell anybody, but because he wants to get an accurate representation of what's going on without like having someone show him all the good parts of town and not showing him the bad parts of town. So he goes out on his own and he does this. And then he comes back, verse 17, it says, then I said to them, the them is the end of verse 16. It's the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest, like all the other remnant that's there that's going to do the work. He says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Ger uh, Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you were doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. That's the end of chapter 2. So if you're taking notes this morning, the first thing uh, that I want to point out to you is that Nehemiah moved toward the broken. Nehemiah moved toward the broken. I mean, back in the beginning of, of chapter one, when he hears about it, it breaks his heart that this is going on, that, that his people are struggling so much. And he prays. And, and last week we talked about praying and staying. And I've already gotten a, a, a praise report of a story, you know, that, that God is doing in the life of our church where somebody felt called to pray and to stay. But Nehemiah didn't stay there forever. He didn't just pray that, God, I hope you send somebody. I hope you do something. God, I hope, I hope, I hope. When the time came for him to go, Nehemiah rode toward the brokenness. He moved toward the brokenness in people's lives, in the life of the city, the, the, the physical brokenness, the spiritual brokenness, the, the family and the emotional brokenness. All of that is a part of the story. And Nehemiah wasn't afraid of it. That's one of the reasons we say that we're a place where no perfect people are allowed in this church. Because if we're all honest in some area of our lives, and for some of us, it's, it's many areas of our lives, we're broken. Our sin broke this world and God sent his son Jesus to be our savior to heal it. The reason that Nehemiah moved toward the broken and the reason that, that we don't need to be afraid to examine what's going on in the darkness in our lives is because that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus moved toward the broken. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that, that, uh, that he didn't come to, to, to heal the healthy. He came for the sick right? Jesus came for the broken, the broken hearted, the broken in body, the broken in spirit and soul. Jesus came toward the broken. He says, this is Jesus speaking in John chapter eight, um, 
Starting in verse 31, it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's verse 31 and 32. As Jesus was on this earth and he moved toward the broken, he said, listen, God, I mean, you know, sometimes we, we like elevate the disciples of Jesus, but they were just men like we are. And, and they messed up all the time. Peter, you know, we, all, we like to pick on Peter. It's like Peter messed up all the time. And what Jesus said to him is, listen, I came to set you free and here's how you're going to be set free. Be in my word. Be about kingdom things. He said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus was the way is the way, the truth and the life. If you are going to move toward the broken in your life, if you're going to move toward the broken in someone else's life to help them out, you're not going to be afraid to examine the darkness and you're going to shine the light of God on that. What you need is the word of God. You need to be in God's word every single day. The reason that I gave you a, a prayer journal to, to follow along with us for these 21 days is because each day has a, has a short devotion. It's got like one verse. I'm not asking you to read the whole Bible in 21 days, right? For some of you, if you've never read the Bible before, just try to read the New Testament like this year. You know, that's not even half of the Bible, but just, just get in the word because we know that when we sit, when we abide, when we sit and we soak in God's word, it begins to change our hearts. The light of God pierces the darkness in us. The light of God pierces the darkness in other people through us because you know what Jesus said to us? You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world, not in your own power, not by anything that, that, that you accomplished, but because Jesus is in you. If you've trusted Jesus as your savior, you are the light of the world. You bring his light into the darkness. And that is exactly what Jesus did and what Nehemiah did. There's a Christian author and speaker. Her name is Ann Voskamp. Some of you may have heard of her. Um, she's written some, some great books and has a good blog and, and speaks from time to time, um, especially to women's groups. And she says this about, about Jesus moving toward the brokenness. She says, when the church isn't for the suffering and broken, then the church isn't for Christ. Because Jesus with his pierced side is always on the side of the broken. Jesus always moves into places moved with grief. Jesus always seeks out where the suffering is and that's where Jesus stays. The wound in his side proves that Jesus is always on the side of the suffering, the wounded, the busted, the broken. God uses broken things and he uses broken people. You may feel like you're just, you're just not good enough to do what God would have you do in your life. You're right. You see, you're, you're doing worse than you think you are many times because we don't want to admit our sins and our failures and our brokenness to Jesus. But at the same time, you're also doing far better in your life than you think you are when Jesus is a part of your life. Because God will take you right where you are, whatever brokenness that you are sitting in, whatever, whatever uh, misery that you have, and not only will he make it his mission, he'll probably turn it around, heal you, and make it your mission in life to help other people. God helps the broken. He uses the broken, and he heals the broken. And remember, if God gives you a vision, we talked about this last week, whatever vision comes from God is not about you. It's about God. Every time God gives us a God-sized vision, it's going to bring glory to him. It's going to grow the kingdom, and it's going to bless people around us. Now, we're going to get blessed in the process. Nehemiah was blessed in this process. But we're here for God to use us for his glory and to bring other people to him. So because of that, that brings me to number two, if you're taking notes. Nehemiah invited others to help. Nehemiah invited others to help. When he surveyed the darkness, when he, when he moved toward the broken and he rode around town that night and he saw how bad it was, he wasn't like, all right, God, me and you, we got this. Now, could he have? Yes. 
If God wanted to work a miracle and all of a sudden those you know, broken down walls just came up and rebuilt themselves, could God do that? Yes, he spoke and the world sprang into existence. But God chooses to use us. God chooses to work through us. He has blessed us with work. I know we don't like that word, but God has blessed us with work in our lives so that in that work we bring glory and honor to him. So Nehemiah, when he sees how dark it is, how broken it is, he goes and he invites other people to help. He invites other people to help. Um, Proverbs 15, 22 says this, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. If you're not asking people for help, if you're not getting advice, and I don't mean advice, like, if you've got a friend who, whose marriage was struggling and who, like even like you saw it from the outside looking in, the marriage is struggling and that marriage ended in divorce and, and, you know, they went their separate ways and now you've got this friend, male or female, it doesn't matter. And they're like, yeah, man, I'm single. I, I'm great. It's a great place to be. I'm so glad. Like, I'm so glad I'm away from her and your marriage is struggling. You go to that friend for advice. You're an idiot. <laughs> Cause he lost, he failed. Now listen, it's okay to, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to fail. All right. None of us are perfect. But if you go to, to that kind of a person who has the same kind of struggle and they're not inviting God into the midst of their struggle, they're not inviting the light of the word of God into them and God is not healing their brokenness, they're just as broke as you are and they're not going to be able to help to, to fix you. So that's why we say Jesus in us, devil behind us, family of God all around us. You have people in this room who struggle from probably some of the same things that you struggle with, who used to struggle with it, who've been there, they've done that, they trusted Jesus, and Jesus changed them. I promise you, without Jesus, you do not want to meet me in a dark alley. I'm not a nice person. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. An, I'm your pastor. The love of Jesus is in me, and hopefully it comes out of me every day. But if I was just left up to my own devices... I probably wouldn't have a family. I wouldn't have kids. I'd push everybody away and I would beat the living daylights out of anybody that got in, in my way. But Jesus has changed my heart. He's changed who I am. He's called me by name. He calls you by name and he heals that brokenness. So we, we need some advisors around us. Um, and, and Nehemiah, I, I want to I don't want to belabor this point, but I want you to notice that Nehemiah actually included those who had failed when he invited them to join him. All of this remnant that's been there for years that couldn't get the walls built and, and couldn't replace the gates, they're about to succeed where they have failed all along the way. We don't have to be afraid. Now, notice Nehemiah didn't go to them for advice. <laughs> they didn't get it right the first time. But Nehemiah took the plan, he took the word of God to those same people who had failed, and they're about to be victorious. They're about to find freedom in the sanctuary and the fortress of the city that they're going to rebuild around them. He invited those who were broken to help him in this process of healing the brokenness. And that's what we do. Matthew 20, 16, a lot of you have heard this verse before. Uh, I put it on the screen in the King James Version. It says, so the last shall be first and the first last. For many uh, be called, but few are chosen. I feel like this, you know, sometimes just about my life in ministry, how I, I feel like I just get the, the leftovers sometimes. I get the last. I'm sure Nehemiah, as he's surveying the damage and he's looking at all the, you know, the, the people around him and he's like, I don't know how we're going to do this, God. I mean, they, they, I, I just, I, I don't know. I feel like God probably spoke these words into his heart and said, listen, 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 let me remind you. Those that you and the world see as last place, like that, that least likely kid to get picked for the kickball game. That's where I shine the most. Because in your weakness, I'm going to give you my strength. Because the first will be last, but the last will be first in the power of God. And so Nehemiah invites the broken to join him. So I got another point that I'm going to make in a minute. But before I get there, I want to talk about inviting people. 
I don't want to talk about you inviting people. Part of this, this more process. Now, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, hide anything. Next week when you come back, we're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about finances. Everybody thinks like all the church ever asked us for is money. All right. Those of you who've been around here for a long time, you know, we don't pass a plate. We don't beg for money. That's just not what God has called us to do. Now, if you want to give, you can give. And in the, on the screen as you came in this morning, maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't. There's different ways that you can give. But it's, I don't want that to be a barrier between you and God. But at the end of this more process, and, and just like two weeks from today, I'm going to be asking you to, to commit to something, to, to commit financially, to give above and beyond what you're already giving. And if you've never given before, maybe it's just to give for the first time, because we have a vision, we have a plan. I laid out part of it last week. I'm going to lay out a little bit more of it this week. But I don't care how much money we give and how much we pray and how often you show up. If you're not inviting somebody to come along with you, if we're not out in the world meeting people and making friends and inviting them to come with us, why are we doing it? We're just spinning our wheels. It becomes all about us. You know, it's like we've got our holy huddle. We've got our few and we don't need you. You know, it's that kind of thing. Like, no, <laughs> That's not what God has called us to be as a church. So when you came in this morning on every chair and there, there was a stack of, of them on each table, there's a package of 10 of our new invite cards. Now, based on some, some requests and responses, I, I doubled the size. They're foldable. So your package, they're unfolded, but you're going to fold them up and you're going to put a few in your purse and your wallet, whatever. And you're going to go invite some people. You're not inviting them to church. You're inviting them into the kingdom of God. You are inviting them to freedom, to be set free. You're inviting them in their brokenness to healing. That's what you're inviting them to. But we need to be an inviting church. So you can take this and on, on this side it says you are invited. And if you look really closely, it's so cool if you look really closely. I thought it was going to be a little brighter when I designed these. But um, those are people that we got to baptize over the last year or so. And they're, they're in those words because it's, it's a reminder for us. It's a reminder for us. This is why we do what we do. It's to see people set free in salvation by the blood of the lamb. But that little white box under it, what I want to encourage you to do, this was the request that was made to me is, hey, we need some invite cards, but like where we can write our name or phone number or, you know, whatever on it so that people, you know, I mean, they're brand new. They don't know us. Uh, maybe they can, they can text us or call us and let us know that they're coming or, or when they come in the back door, just ask somebody like, um, you know, I'm looking for David or whatever, you know, whatever your name is, and we'll help you find that person. So if you want to use the little white box and write your name on there or write, you know, if you don't mind giving somebody your, your cell number, say, hey, text me, you know, if you're coming on Sunday and, uh, and, and I, you know, I, wanna, I want you to sit with me, whatever it is. We're going to invite. And there's other things. There's a map on the inside and, uh, and our, our service times and whatever. And our no perfect people out on the back. But I want to ask you to invite. And I'm not just going to throw it out there to say, okay, go, go invite everybody. I gave you 10. You may not invite all 10 this week, but try. But invite. Take that package and begin inviting people. And here's what I want you to look for. This is like, like inviting 101. I want you to look for the knot. I want you to look for the knot. There are three areas where if, if your ears are open and you're paying attention and you're seeking God's will, God will show you people. He'll, he'll bring people to you that need you to invite them. And what, the first one is things are not going well. When you hear somebody say things are not going well, you move toward the broken. You, you insert yourself into their life and you invite them into yours. And again, you may not have all the answers. That's okay. But when somebody says things are not going well, that's an opportunity. That's an opening for us to begin to speak into them. Now, please do not be that weird, overbearing Christian who has an answer for every. I mean, we should have an answer for everything, but like actually tells people what to do. Like, you know, you, you, man, you got to get that sin out of here until you know them. You know, people need the love of Jesus just like they need the truth of Jesus. So don't be the kind of person that, that beats somebody over the head with the truth and then does not love them and ridicules them for not coming to church with you or whatever it is, but invite them. 
Step into their brokenness. Bring the light of Jesus with you. When you hear things are not going well, that's your opportunity to invite. The second one is, I was not prepared for. Now, this is very similar to things are not going well, all right? But this is, this is I wasn't prepared. Like, I'm a parent, and I've got, I've got four kids personally, and I know a lot of y'all got kids. Um, but there comes a time in, in most parents, if not all parents' lives, where, like, they're looking at their kid and something's going on, and they're like, I'm not prepared for this. I don't, I don't know how to handle this one. Things like that in life. I, 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 I'm not prepared. I, I lost my job. That's, that's a difficult thing, but like I was not prepared to, you know, to, to create a resume and to go out and look for another job again. And anything that you hear like that where somebody was not prepared. Let me remind you from our story, Nehemiah chapter 2, the king was not prepared for Nehemiah that day. He wasn't. And Nehemiah invited him to join the mission. The king said, I've never seen you sad before. He wasn't prepared to respond to Nehemiah as he saw Nehemiah in his sadness. But Nehemiah took that opportunity to invite the king into his mission, into God's mission and God's vision. And then the third one is, I'm not from here. If you meet somebody at Walmart and like they just moved into town, invite them to church. (laughs) Whether they're looking for one or not. Invite them, and especially if you hear somebody that's, that's looking. Like, it, if, if they say, I'm not from here, great. I am, come on, you can sit with me, we'll go to lunch after, whatever it is. I'm not from here. So when, one of you, when you hear one of these three cues, your automatic response after today is not to ignore it and to keep walking. It's not to be like, thank God I don't have those kids, you know, walking through Kroger. Right, Robbie? Yeah. (laughs) No. Your automatic response should be to move toward the brokenness, to move in and to invite someone to come along with you. Because hopefully God is doing something in your life. God has done something in your life at this church. Now, you may not be where you think you ought to be or where you want to be, but I promise you, If you're here for very long and you've been coming for very long, God's doing a work in you because you're hearing the truth of God's word. And and the Bible tells us very clearly that his word does not return void. Um, Rambo, I don't know what the buzzing is, but I'm going to steal his mic. I don't know. No, it shouldn't be. All right. Well, I'll go back to this one. No big deal. Satan has been attacking for weeks, days, days and weeks. Um, And he wants to distract you from this message. He wants to distract me from this message. I don't want to over-spiritualize, but I don't believe I can over-spiritualize because as I taught you over and over again. Man, we are in a spiritual battle in every battle, every battle, every argument that you've had with a spouse, with your kids, even when nation is fighting against other nation, there is a battle behind the battle. There's a spiritual war going on always in the background. And Satan is always trying to to derail us. But Jesus in me, Satan behind me, church family around me, we're going to keep moving forward for God. And we're going to invite people to join us. So, number three, if you're taking notes, last thing from this passage I want to share this morning is this. Nehemiah ridiculed the ridiculous. Now, don't be unkind to people, but when people are dumb, point out the dumbness. Don't be afraid as a Christian. Don't be like, well, I got to be nice and I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. You're not offending somebody and you're not hurting somebody's feelings is causing us to lose our children. One of the reasons that we're doing more the way that we're doing more, the, 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 the reason that we're having these prayers and we're, I'm going to ask you to contribute financially, is for our neighbors and the next generation. Our world is full of darkness and it needs the light of Jesus. And that darkness is pulling our kids away. And if we sit in silence and we don't respond to it with the word of God, then we might as well be complicit in it, going along with it in the world around us. If it's not God's word, it's just wrong. 
We will always, always, always side with the word over the world, no matter who it offends. Because you may need to be reminded of this, but Jesus came and said, I'm going to offend people. Because of me and my name, families are going to be broken apart. Now, we know that Jesus is love, that God is love, that Jesus came into the world because God loves the whole world. But the reality is the truth of God's word drives the enemy away. And when you share that truth, the enemy will be driven away. But as you share that truth, some will be saved. Some will come toward the light. Some will move into the kingdom of God and trust Jesus as their savior. But Nehemiah, he ridiculed the ridiculous. At the end of that chapter, when Sanballat and Tobiah and all those guys, they're showing up and they're like, what are you doing, you idiot? They they couldn't do this before you got here. And and we're going to be here after you're gone. Nehemiah said, you know what? We're here because God called us here. You don't get to take part. Simple, to the point. You might say that he overlooked his oppressors because they were trying to oppress him. And, and you know, I, I know in business they say, like, don't overlook your opposition. Um, that you, like, like, you need to know who you're competing against and whatever, and don't overlook your opposition. I want to tell you this morning, overlook your opposition. Because we use that word wrongly in, our, in, in the way that we normally use it. We think it's like we're ignoring them, not just that we're ignoring them, that we don't even notice that this is going on. And sometimes we want, to, we want to ignore some of the things in the world and just put our head in the sand and, and pretend like we don't notice. That's not what overlooking the opposition is talking about, and that's not biblical. This is, this is overlooking the opposition. Yeah, they're, they're here. You, you see those who are ridiculous in front of you, but you're looking up to Jesus. You're focusing on things of the kingdom and on his word and his ways. You're not getting distracted by what's down here. You're not like Peter who goes to walk on the water and when the waves begin to wash over him, he takes his eyes off Jesus and he begins to sink. Now we want to overlook our opposition. Colossians 3, 1 through 3 says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. When Christ, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Matthew 6, uh, 32 and 33, our theme verse comes from this. Jesus is teaching about, about worrying, and he says, don't, like, why do you worry? Why, why do you worry about the, the food that you eat or the clothes that you wear? Don't you know that your heavenly Father is going to take care of you? If he's going to take care of the, of the flowers in the field and the birds in the air, he's going to take care of you because you're his child. And at the, uh, toward the end of that chapter in verse 32, it says, for the Gentiles seek after all these things, Listen, the world around you is chasing after all the stuff of the world, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. He knows you need to eat. He knows you need clothing. He knows that you need a place to live and safety and security. So verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. When we keep our eyes on Jesus, the opposition will still be there. The ridiculous will still be around us but they won't impact us. They won't, they won't keep us from the mission that God has called us to. Psalm 121, I love this one. It's a song of a sense. It says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. The Lord watches over us. So we look to the mountains. It's not easy being a leader. It's not easy living for the kingdom. Like all of us agree, like we want the promised land. We want the land flowing with milk and honey. We want God's blessings in our lives. But none of us really want to, you know, either walk through the wilderness to get there or trust God that the, that the, that the waves won't crash over us. And we definitely, definitely, definitely don't want to be out in this ridiculous muggy heat fighting a battle while God makes the sun stand still above us and we fight a battle all day long. 
If you don't know that story, you can go and read that about the sun standing still. But sometimes we don't want to face those struggles. But that's what we got to go through to get to where God wants us to be. So in our lives, we're going to move toward the broken. We're going to uh, ridicule the ridiculous. And we are absolutely going to invite others along with us and invite us, invite, I'm inviting you to help me in this more series. So let me, give me like five more minutes. I want to expand on what I, I told you last week um, about the, the more and where we're, you know, looking to, to change some things. So we believe with all of our hearts that when we pray more, we invite more and we give more, we'll be able to do more for the kingdom of God through the church at Lake Forest. So I'm inviting you to join me in this. And, uh, and what, we're, what we're envisioning is the creation of spaces, the updating of spaces, whatever, that, that helps us on our mission for our neighbors and the next generation. So we've got three goals, and I'm just going to read these to you. Goal number one is to modernize the outside of the building to reflect the inside and our style in general. You know, a lot of people just drive by here, they've lived here forever, and they just see us as a, the typical little country church, you know, out in walls. Ain't nothing else going on in walls. Let's be the place where, stuff's ha- where stuff is happening. All right? So we want the outside to reflect who we are on the inside. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, number two, we want to create outdoor spaces to build community with each other and our surrounding community. There are some spaces that I'm going to talk about where the goal of those spaces is going to benefit us. We're going to get blessed, but it's not for us. It's for our community. There's some things that we want to do outside of this building. And then number three, and this one is honestly the closest to my heart. It has been for a long time. I know it was, you know, my dad was pastor here for years. I know this was, this was close to his heart too. The third goal is to invest in reaching across the Sunday racial divide to the other 40% of our community. We are a church that's in the middle of, it's about 50% white in our community. It's about 40% black. It's about 9% Hispanic. And you know, there's always that 1% of everything else. And you all know as well as I do that Sunday is the most racially divided day of the week. Black people go to black churches, white people go to white churches. Thank God we have some black people who come to our church regularly and we love them. We've got to do a better job And I can't do it on my own because I don't honestly know how to reach that demographic of our community. And so part of the funds that we're committing over the next three years is going to go to address that failure, to address that yearning for for what's to come. So let me just start with that one. Um, The first thing that we're going to, not the first thing we're going to invest money in, but the first thing I want to share with you is for at least three years, we want to be able to offset the salary of a new staff member. I know we got plenty of staff. We're a small church. We got a lot of staff, but we want to add a new staff member who's going to help us. Their whole job will simply to be outreach in our community. That's it. Specifically what I'm praying for and what I want to invite you to pray for with me is that God will send Probably young, but I'm okay with old too. Old people are going to heaven with me, right? (laughs) But that God will send a young, dynamic, black, male or female, preferably that can worship on stage with us. They can sing or play an instrument, put a mic in their hand, but that has a heart for this community and doesn't care who might make fun of them for going to a white church. Because that's who we need to help us reach that part of our community. So we're, we're looking for funds to help offset the cost. Obviously we're gonna commit you know, some of the, the everyday budget that we have to this, but it's not gonna get us there. We don't wanna ask somebody to come for free to do what we can't do. We're gonna pay them, hopefully we can pay them well to come in and help us do what we believe that God has called us to do. So that's the first thing. The second thing, Um, that I'll share with you is we want to update the outside of the building. We want to update the front porch of this building, update the front, actually add not a porch, but a covering on the front porch of the other building and then paint both buildings, paint the brick to match so that it looks nice. It looks modern. There's some other plans that we've got in that, Um, but basically update the outside of building A and building B, add some new signage, update the sign at the road, not, not, not like tear it down and replace it, but just update it. And then 
uh, put up some new signage around the church. That's probably going to cost us around $50,000. That's what we're looking to do. Um, where this all started was actually talking about our parking lot. This whole parking lot needs to be dug up uh, to fix it right. We've already got gravel at the end that used to be paved. And then the pavement up to about this building uh, was here forever and it's crumbling and it, it all needs to be dug up and about half of the rest of the parking lot needs to be dug up to completely repair our parking lot. This is where we started in our conversation. But this is the last thing on my list that I care about because after all, it's just asphalt, right? But to repair our parking lot the way that it needs to be repaired, I've already gotten estimates, it's going to be a minimum of $85,000 to repair the parking lot the way that it needs to be repaired. Now, we're a small church. We don't have that kind of money, right? I mean, nobody, I don't think anybody in here can just write that check for $85,000 and it not hurt a lot, right? And we can't do it as a church. So that's on our list of things that we would like to do. We want to... Um, I know we had this vision for a while before I came about building a, a gym, a gymnasium called you know, The Rock. Some of you remember that. God has not blessed us in that way, but what God has blessed us with as we, like Nehemiah, survey what God has given us to work with, we've got seven and a half acres on this property, and most of it's back there and it's grassy and ain't nothing built on it. So let's use that acreage. Part of what we want to do over the course of the next three years is to develop some sports fields behind us so that we can do flag football and soccer. Now, I'd also like to do basketball because I know that that will be, you know, that, that'll speak to our community in a big way and we'll, we'll eventually hopefully get to that. But we're going to start with what God's already given us. So we're going to do a little field work, put up some fencing, you know, maybe some lights, whatever we got to do um, to get that prepped. And uh, in addition to that, the sports fields, we also, we've never had a, a, a kid's playground. So we want to put in a decent, like elementary age playground. It won't be huge because we're a small church, but you know, maybe give us some room to grow. Um, but we want to put in a playground for our children and have it open to our community that they can come use it. Because right beside that playground and near those sports fields, I also want to build a pavilion. A pavilion, an outdoor open air space. And my prayer is that God will bless us so abundantly that that pavilion will actually be the foundation for the rock. Now, if God decides that that's not what we're supposed to do and, and, and that much money doesn't come in, but enough money comes in to build a small pavilion, we're going to do that. Because many of you have asked, like, could, could we have something like that here? We've got the space. We'd love to have, you know, dinner on the grounds and be able to be out in the shade instead of the heat under a pavilion with some fans. You know, maybe a sound system or a screen or whatever. That, but that, we just want to get the, the structure up. So, with funding and with uh, sweat equity from all of us, we believe that we can do those things. We can move some dirt. We can prepare the sports fields, the playground, and put up at least a basic pavilion for about $150,000 for all of those things. And then finally, oh, I already mentioned the, the, uh, the staff member. So, if you add all those numbers up, the total cost is $330,000. Our yearly budget is about two fifty. Three thirty dollars is a big number. It's a number that I can't do on my own, just like Nehemiah couldn't do it on his own. Where did he go for the funding to get it done? He went to the king. Where did he go for the labor to get it done? He went to his people. I'm asking you to join me because you're my people. You're part of not my church, you're part of God's church. You're part of the family of the kingdom of God in Walls, Mississippi at the church at Lake Forest. You're part of this family. I'm not asking you to, to give a certain amount like every family commit to, you know, to a certain figure because some of us have been blessed differently than others. So we're not asking for equal giving. What, what I'm asking you to begin considering today is equal sacrifice. That it's going to cost all of us something to get there. And the goal is not to play football. The goal is not to play soccer. The goal is not to have a fish fry under the pavilion. That's not the goal. The goal isn't for our kids to be able to, you know, run around and play in a safe environment on a playground outside. That's not the goal. The goal is the kingdom. Because we're going to do this. You're going to go invite people to that 
fish fry or whatever it is. You're going to invite your neighbors and their kids to join our soccer teams, to join our football teams. You're going to invite people to join us here to this awesome space that God has already blessed us with. You're going to start now, but you're going to be even more excited about inviting them to the new stuff in the next three to five years as those things begin to happen. And we're inviting them here, again, not to play football, not to play soccer, not to eat some good fried fish or smoke brisket or whatever it is. I'm getting hungry. Lunch in the oven, and I know it's getting late. And thank you for sticking with me for so long. But we're inviting people to the kingdom. Because when they come and they play soccer, they play football, we're going to share the word of God with them. When they come and they sit under the pavilion with us, we're going to share the love of Jesus through food. You know I relate to that. But we're also going to share the love of Jesus through his word. We are going to be the light and the darkness in Walls, Mississippi. We, listen, God has set us up and blessed us in a way there ain't nothing else really going on around us. We can be a place where people can call us and say, hey, I heard you had a pavilion and you had a playground and you had some sports fields. Like, is it possible for me to do a family reunion at your church? I mean, I don't go to your church, but I live in Walls. Is that okay? Yes. Use it. We want to invite people in. I love it when this building gets used for things outside of Sunday and Wednesday. Like the DeSoto County Sheriff's Department came in just, you know, in the last year and they did a training in here and it was like a hostage, you know, environment. Like they were holding people hostage and, and you know, negotiating and all of that. I, I know they did that at one point. Like whatever it is, we want to invite our community in because God has something here for them and for us. So come back next week, talk a little bit more about those finances. We're going to look at Nehemiah chapter three, and I'm going to hopefully very clearly call you to give the following week and be prepared to, to move in that direction. Before I pray, let me say one more thing, and that is this. Um, if you know somebody that wasn't here today and, and you know, missed the message or missed last week's message, if you go to tcaf.com right now, at the top of the page and click on the little more icon, or if you just go to tcaf.com slash more, the brochure that's in the back of all the chairs that you're free to take with you if you didn't get one of those last week, um, the journal, if we run out of journals, people can download it. Last week's message got uploaded on Monday. You know, normally I do that on like, it goes live on Sunday and we did that too, but it, we uploaded it on Monday. We're gonna try to do the same thing this week so that nobody gets left behind or left out. So share that with, uh, with the people that you know who call this their church home. All right, now let me pray for us and we'll be dismissed. God, you have laid so much on our hearts. And God, I know that I shared a lot of information this morning. And I pray that we will not miss the forest for the trees. God, don't, don't let us get caught up in all the details of of the what ifs and the what nows and, and whatever. God, this week, keep us in your word. This week, keep us on our knees. Keep us praying to you. Because we look to the mountains where our help comes from. God, we look to you, your salvation. God, keep us in your word. Keep us praying. And God, this week, challenge us to invite, to invite someone to this church because God, we're praying for the 400. We believe that you have already blessed us and you're gonna to continue to bless us. We believe that we've had some great days behind us, but we're not satisfied with the good old days because God, you have something even better planned for us, even better in our future that you're leading us to. So God, help us to look for that Help us to remember to share stories with each other as you do things in our lives. Because God, you are changing hearts. And through this church, you will change this community. God, we gotta be on your mission. So God, remind us to be in your word, on our knees, and inviting people this week. We love you, we thank you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, church. Y'all have a good week.